excited to have you here with us today. Um, you probably just got a notification from me that we are in fact recording this talk today. So um, please note that um, for all participants, we, we will be able to um, hear you at least uh, later on. I think we're just planning actually to record the, the talk portion and then we will stop the recording for, for the Q&A so people can perhaps talk more, more freely. Um, we're very, very excited to have a guest with us today that we've been hoping to have on the BEMP uh, for a while, Peter Tennant. And um, he will be talking today about Lord's Paradox, which I'll let him explain to you. But I would like to explain uh, Peter a bit. Peter is a, a very active member on Epi Twitter, which is actually how we met in addition to the SCR, Society of Epidemiological Research Conference. And Peter is an excellent public speaker, an excellent lecturer. He's done a lot of lecturing um, in his job at the Leeds Institute for Data Analytics, I hope I got that right, at the University of Leeds. And he teaches um, in the Health Data Analytics and Summer School and Causal Inferences, Inference courses and um, does a lot of interesting research and, let's say, um, advocacy for the use of causal graphs in practice. So. This is something that um, Peter and I have in common. We're both really passionate about, and I'm so glad that we could have him here today at the BEMC. Before we get started, just a quick um, ground rule for the talk for those of you who are new. You can ask any questions that come into your mind uh, during the talk in the Q&A. There's a little button at the bottom of the Zoom webinar screen, and you can also upvote questions that others have asked. So if you'd like to do that, we will save the questions for the end and hopefully have a nice, lively discussion. If you would like to ask your question using your mic, um, please note that as well, and then I can unmute you at the end so you can actually ask the question yourself and make it a bit more interactive. I think that's it. I've also invited some, some pan panelist members to be with us uh, here in Berlin, so Peter doesn't have to just look at a plain black screen the entire time. So thank you, pa panelists, for joining us. And without further ado, Peter, over to you. Well, okay, now we can hear you. Good. Uh, now I just need my slides to respond. <laughs> Which have uh, decided to play an interesting game and go all the way to the end of the presentation. <laughs> I don't even know how I did that. Um, so, that was wonderful. Yes, <laughs> that was Lord's Paradox. I hope you, I, nicely done in reverse, I hope you now all understand um, <laughs> what I'm about to talk about. Um, I'm not 100% sure that I do. Um, this is my honest confession. Um, hence, I've changed my title briefly to the mind-boggling truth behind this 50-year um, puzzle. Um, and I'm also kind of feeling a little uh, annoyed at myself um, because when uh, the Berlin Epi Methods Colloquium um, contacted me first a year ago, um, Jessica, I think, who I was in contact with said, um, what would you like to talk about? There's two different topics I could talk about. Uh, one is this forthcoming uh, review um, on the use of directed acyclic graphs, um, which is, you know, uh, due in International Journal of Epidemiology any day. Um, and then there's this other thing that I've been working on, um, which, uh, you know, it's a bit different uh, about Lord's Paradox. You might be interested in that. And of course, he jumped on Lord's Paradox. Um, and with a year to go, I thought that, that, that shouldn't be a problem. Uh, but it's been an interesting year. Um, and so now that it gets to uh, the moment, I can tell you I've been uh, working right up to, to this um, minute uh, to try and provide um, the best understanding for myself and the best explanation, hopefully, uh, at least of my understanding. And I'm going to jump in with Lord himself, because what I'm going to describe today, essentially, is a problem, is a statistical puzzle that was first outlined in 1967 by Frederick Lord in this, um, in this kind of nightmare paper 
um, but that has continued um, to cause discussion at the very least and confusion for the 50 years since then. And I'm going to start by giving you uh, his words, uh, some of which um, are correct, some of which I would say need reinterpreting, and then I will try and delve into it um, and make sense of it. But we will see how this goes. So here is um, the scenario. Um, that's interesting that I could only see part of my screen. Um, there we are. Right, so a large university, this is what Lord said, is interested in investigating the effects of the diet provided in the university dining halls and any sex differences in these effects. And the weight of each student was measured um, at the time of their arrival uh, in September and at the end of the term in June. And at the end of the year, those data, which we're just talking essentially two data points, the weight at the start and the end, and then whether or not there's any difference by sex, were analyzed in this example by two statisticians, okay, both of who divided that data by sex. And to make our life easier, I'm going to depict these two statisticians as superheroes, or at least um, as um, uh, Power Rangers, purple Power Ranger statistician one, and the blue uh, Power Ranger statistician two, and anyone who has ever had to work um, doing applied uh, research as a statistician will feel that this is a very deserving um, way to depict these two, let's say, heroes of the 20th century. So, statistician one approached the puzzle with one particular approach. Statistician one examined the mean weight of the girls at the beginning of the year and at the end of the year and found they were the same. If the same for the boys, they were also the same. Okay, so in Lord's words, although the weight of the individual boys and girls had usually changed during the course of the year, the group of girls as a whole had not changed and the group of boys as a whole had not changed. So statistician one concluded, there's no evidence of any interesting effect of the school diet or anything else on student weight. And most importantly, there is no evidence of any differential effect between the sexes. Now Lord says that this whole situation is shown in this Truly nightmarish diagram. Okay, so we have here two ellipses, which in a sense represent um, a cloud, two clouds of data, separate scatter plots, the boys and the girls. And what Lord said was that the distributions of baseline weight are indicated on the, bot uh, on the top here. So you could see these two kind of normal distributions, one dotted for the girls and one um, not dotted. Um, and the distributions of follow-up weight are on the left. So again, you can see these two blue distributions representing the girls and the boys. And so he said people falling on that solid 45 degree line at the middle of this graph um, are those whose baseline and follow-up weight were identical. And the fact that the center of each ellipse lies on that line um, shows that there was no mean gain, no mean change overall in either sex. Now, statistician two adopts a different approach. Statistician two adopts an approach known as ANCOVA, uh, which is essentially to analyze, uh, which is known as the analysis of covariance, um, but in perhaps slightly more modern parlance would be to analyze the follow-up weight and condition on the baseline in some way. Um, and statistician two, by doing this, essentially is determining regression slopes for the two groups. They find that those two slopes are parallel. As you can see here, they, um, the, the relationship is, uh, is, is exactly the same um, for boys and girls. But that the difference, but that there is this, this noticeable difference between the intercepts. So in other words, the boys have a higher um, intercept than the girls, which means that for the same 
baseline weight, you can expect the boys to have a higher weight than the girls. So statistician two concludes the boys showed significantly more gain in weight than the girls when proper allowance is made for the differences in baseline weight. And we have a very familiar situation, I imagine, for anyone who has been involved in scientific research and dared to seek more than one opinion. So Lord imagines this college dietitian um, who really is not so comfortable with this. They have some difficulty reconciling these two conclusions because essentially statistician one says there is no evidence of change during the year for either boys or girls and no evidence of differential change between sexes. Nothing really is going on. Whereas statistician two says wherever boys and girls start with the same baseline weight, it is obvious that the subgroup of boys gains more than the subgroup of girls. If that doesn't sound like a paradox, um, then I don't know what one sounds like. Because clearly these two people are essentially giving you practically very, very different conclusions. And Lord poses this point that if the dietitian had only one statistician, I, I, I've added in uh, the different options that these statisticians and dietitians could be because he tends to assume that the statisticians are male and the dietitian is a female. But anyway, he, she, they would reach very different conclusions depending on which person they had spoken to. Goodness me, what a nightmare. Um, perhaps we can find an answer to this problem and understand this problem by looking through the 50 years of literature on the topic. That was one of my hopes. Um, well, uh, needless to say, there's a lot that has been said. And um, I'm not sure how useful as a whole it is. Um, and let me give you an example. We'll just explore some of the conclusions that different people have made. Um, so uh, Locasio and Cordray said essentially, method one provides the correct assessment. London and Wright said, actually, usually method two will be preferred. Holland and Rubin, they, they decide to take a different option. If both statisticians made only descriptive statements, they would both be correct. But for causal statements, neither would be correct or incorrect because of untestable assumptions. So they haven't really answered anything. They've said, there's nothing wrong with describing the data however you want, but if you wanted to ask a causal question, well, we just don't have enough information. Hill is more optimistic. He says, both statisticians were correct. They just estimated different things. Okay. And now we get into increasing levels of avoidance, I would say. Multi-level modeling can ameliorate the divergence inside. Excellent. Still doesn't really answer the question. And one of my favorites of all, it's not a paradox. If the parameters are interpreted as predictive, um, or as causal with much stricter conditions. That is pretty much the state of mind of the literature. Um, and one's instinct, having gone through all of that, um, is very much to just say, no, um, <laughs> thanks very much. I, I'm going to leave this alone and, and, and walk away. Because it, it, it really is one of those um, irreconcilable uh, sets of um, disagreement. But I'm not kind of happy with doing that because although Lord's paradox is itself an extremely esoteric example, and you know you can easily argue that um, it's just navel gazing to really work out this specific example and what's going on. Unfortunately for all of us, it actually reflects a much larger puzzle um, that exists in the analysis of particularly non-experimental data, but let's just say all data, and the use of change scores, which you may also have heard by various other names, gain scores, different scores, change from baseline variables, etc. I'll just tell you what they are. So a change score variable, I'm going to call them change scores from now on, are composite variables that have been constructed from repeated measures of a single parent variable. 
Okay, so we have this situation where there is a baseline variable and a follow-up variable, y0 baseline, y1 follow-up. And what we've done is we've calculated the change by subtracting the baseline from the follow-up. I'll just show that again. It is a composite of those two things. And when we realize that, we can look back at the analysis, that, which is described in very kind of 1960 terminology, but we can look back at the analysis that Statistician 1 and Statistician 2 did and realize that essentially what Statistician 1 has done is an analysis of the change score. They have analyzed how the um, change differs between boys and girls. And because neither boys nor girls changed, there's no difference. You can hear this described as an ANOVA of change as well. And interesting enough, it is exactly the same mathematically as a difference in difference analysis. So in as kind of regression terms, your model might look something like this. Change score is your outcome, and you're then analyzing how some um, exposure or group variable um, is uh, determining that outcome. And then statistician two was an ANCOVER approach or what we might simply call an analysis of the follow-up Y1 adjusted for the baseline Y0. So here in the kind of regression terms you see there, looking at the follow-up variable and they have included the baseline variable in their, their model um, as, as a covariate. So these are two kind of philosophically different approaches, but at least we can now see underneath the bonnet um, what really um, they're planning to do. And if we look at the wide, even larger literature on the analysis of change scores, perhaps we can now find a better answer as to which um, is correct, if indeed any one of them is correct, and what maybe is really going on. And when you um, look at um, experimental data, so this is the kind of data that you would get from a randomized control experiment, then I'm pleased to say that quite a clear message comes through. And that is that a chain score analysis and a follow-up adjusted for baseline analysis actually produce, on average, um, the same estimate. One of the interesting things is that the chain score analysis is less efficient and so for those who are familiar with experimental data, the what used to be the ANCOVA approach, but we might just call it the kind of baseline adjusted approach these days, is the recommended approach for analyzing randomized control trial data or experimental data, because it's more efficient. So in that world, the argument has been won. There is not really any need to be using change scores. Unfortunately, in non-experimental data, it is not so clear. And indeed, exactly the same situation as we saw when you focus specifically on Lord's paradox comes forth, which is that if you conduct a change score analysis or a follow-up adjusted for baseline analysis, they will give you, in many circumstances, extremely different values and sometimes sign opposed values. So is it that one of them is right? If so, which one? Or is it that we're looking at the same thing from different angles? I don't know. But, well, I hope to try and explain. But clearly, this is something of great interest because the analysis of change is one of the most fundamentally interesting and useful things that we might seek to do when analyzing any data um, for causal inference. Let's have a look at see what the advice is within the literature. Oh, alas, again, we have a difference of opinion. If you look at these two authors, you'll see that they both think, in a sense, the analysis of chain score is the way forward. Van uh, Brukelen in non-randomized trials, an over of change seems less biased than Amco. Glymore in 2005, in some cases, Chain score analysis without baseline adjustment will provide unbiased estimates, whereas the baseline adjusted estimates will be biased. Okay, so you read those two, nice and simple message. But you read these two, and the opposite. 
Sen in 2006. Although many situations can be envisaged where ANCOVA is biased, it is very difficult to imagine circumstances where the change score analysis would then be unbiased. And undoubtedly my favorite um, for the eccentricity of the language when you first read it um, is Shahar and Shahar in 2010, where they say modeling the change between two points is justified in very few situations. So we're back to really knowing no more about this problem um, than we might have if we just first dipped our toes in. And really my suggestion to sadly for all those great scholars who have gone before is dump it, <laughs> forget it. The literature is not going to help you very much. There are many eloquent arguments made by many different people. And unless you really um, approach it um, uh, with a very specific angle, you're unlikely um, to know who's, you know, who's right in a sense um, or what to believe. So my recommendation, and the only way I could really approach this was to start again and say, okay, I, I don't know really what's going on here. Um, I'm going to approach it from a new angle. Um, and the angle that I try and take with everything these days, whatever I'm doing, uh, much to the uh, frustration of, of some, um, is I want to use causal inference methods. I want to use um, DAGs, directed acyclic graphs, etc. So causal inference methods, broadly speaking, like Judea Pill's structural causal model, um, are a mathematical, philosophical, and graphical framework that we can use for considering our data analysis, particularly causal data analysis, which kind of integrates probability theory, counterfactual reasoning, and graphical model theory. But for this problem, one of the most important features of a causal inference approach, as we might call it, is actually this fundamental separation between the data analysis and identifying what it is you really want to know. So this is what's known as identification um, and how we separate identifying our causal effect, the thing we want to know, from the estimate, the thing we obtain. And although in a sense, a good uh, data analyst, a good statistician will have done this throughout their whole career, there is also a long-standing tendency for us to jump into the data and play around and see what happens without necessarily taking proper pause to ask what it is we want to know. And so this kind of formal approach involves the separation of your um, causal kind of inference process into three stages. The estimand, the estimator, and the estimate. And I'll just briefly explain what they are. The estimand is the thing you seek. This is the book of the cake that you've decided you want to make for your child's birthday party. Um, that, you know, this is Olav, I guess. The, it looks disgusting to actually eat, but it looks very impressive. Um, I've decided I want to make this Olav cake, um, or I want to know the true difference in some variable due to an exposure. So that's the first stage. What it is I actually want to know, in a sense. What is the causal effect that I then want to go and estimate. And it is from that that we then go and build our estimator, which is in a sense our recipe, our model. What model do we need? What statistical approach do we need in order to try and achieve an estimate of that estimate, in order to try and produce that cake? And then the nice thing about this is that it distinctly separates what it is you want from what it is you get, the estimate, the approximate solution that hopefully gives you a vague sense of the direction you are aiming for, um, but not always. <laughs> but at least you can proudly hold up your estimate and say, well, I knew what I wanted, and I'm, I'm roughly, I'm pretty confident that this roughly represents the right thing. So can a causal inference approach help us to understand Lord's paradox? That's the question. Um, I hope so. 
Because certainly the very first thing we do if we look at Lord's paradoxes is we think about that estimand and we realize it was extremely unclear. We say, well, hang on, Lord said this. Large university is interested in investigating the effects of the diet provided in the university dining halls and any sex difference in these effects. Well, if the university wants to know about the effects of diet, then why on earth isn't it just studying diet? That should be the main exposure. Fair enough. Okay. The second problem is, the, is actually the exposure that was chosen instead, which is very unclear, is sex. You know, what the statisticians talk about, whether there are interesting effects of sex. But sex is an extremely questionable exposure. It's certainly not what some uh, epidemiologists would call well-defined. Any effects would be some kind of confusing mix of biological factors, behavioral factors, sociocultural factors. Are they things we inherit? Are they things we experience? Well, Holland and Rubin argued that since any causal study requires the exposure to be um, suitable for experimental manipulation, then this Lord's paradox situation can only ever be descriptive. But I would say that that is just a red herring because we could easily replace sex with anything else. It's any other variable we choose that would be well-defined and the same data pattern, the same confusing paradox would exist. So, and in fact, Lord actually goes on to provide other examples after um, he received the same kind of criticism. So that doesn't solve our problem. It's, it's very useful to be kind of pointing out these things, but it doesn't solve the problem. The problem lies with the outcome. Why? Well, both statisticians are interested, broadly speaking, in change in weight. So we can say they both kind of agree that they're interested in what is the implied causal effect of sex on change in weight, whatever this means. But that's the problem. It sounds deceptively simple. What is change? This is the kind of question you don't expect to end up asking. But this is where the presentation, I bear, takes a tumble down um, the rabbit hole or certainly walks through the looking glass. This is now where things really start to get mind boggling. Um, and I, I, mean, I suppose I could kind of um, flag up and warn my perspective here is ultimately the perspective outlined by Shahar and Shahar in 2010, um, and then by myself and colleagues um, in 2019, in a paper that I've been working on for four years, and which has had the single most exhausting peer review process I've ever gone through. So you might read that as saying, I'm clearly don't really know what I'm doing, and there are big problems here, but um, I would hope that the truth is that this is quite challenging um, to um, explain, at least, or, or at least that there's a lot of room for discussion. And really at the heart of this is that there are two differing philosophical perspectives on change. That is not necessarily what you would expect as a data scientist or an epidemiologist, um, that eventually um, you get down the rabbit hole far enough to realize you have to ask the question, what do we mean by change? And we could mean two things. You could imagine that change is something that has caused our follow-up. So we have our baseline variable, and then there is a change process, and then our follow-up variable is some combination of those two things. Or we could imagine that change is caused by both. It's caused by the baseline and the follow-up. Certainly a change score, if you remember, was follow-up minus the baseline. And those two beliefs, those two perspectives, ultimately sit at the heart of the debate. And Shahar and Shahar have obviously themselves crashed into this debate um, in the peer review process for their own paper, because their introduction brings up the peer review comments that they received, which of course I, I take some comfort from. Um, but the beauty is, they say in their introduction, you know, shouldn't this be simple? For example, don't we somehow know whether change in X, 
is a cause of follow-up. According to one former reviewer of this article, the answer is trivial. Change is definitely not a cause of X2, a follow-up. But another former reviewer also had no doubt the answer is trivial. Change is definitely a cause of X2, a follow-up. Here is the problem. We're going to have to agree what we actually mean. And in fact, both are correct. But they are very different things. So from my philosophical perspective, I would say that follow-up is indeed caused by some, um, by its baseline variable, and we'll just call it exogenous change to represent all this external process and external reason why there has been change, okay? But then there is also the change score, okay? And that this is indeed determined and can only be determined once y0 and y1 have been observed. It is something as um, Judea Pearl described it, it is what the clock calculates. It is not what nature is doing, okay? So we now have these slightly two different concepts. One is, is, a, is an underlying process that is leading to our future value, and the other is something we calculate ourselves. And we have assumed that these give you the same thing, but they do not. They are not the same. We argue change scores do not capture exogenous change. Oh my goodness, <laughs> what does this mean? And what is going on? So, just to highlight this, I mean, my argument essentially is going in the direction of change score variables are junk, okay? And I will highlight this in the more eloquent words of Shahar and Shahar, where they say a change score variable is no more than a derived variable, does not cause anything, and is not of causal interest. And so the simple message, if you were to just trust them and trust me, would be, okay, change scores are useless, I'm not going to use them. That could be your, your simple take-home message. However, of course, I suspect you would want a little bit more convincing um, before you reach that stage. So this is my philosophical um, journey into working out what we really mean by change. So the future values of a variable, I'm going to keep going with Y1, are determined by three things the past values of that variable. Clearly, I mean, that's, this is an autocorrelative process. Um, some of that information has to have come from the past, so the past value of that variable. Then there will also be random variation, unless you really are measuring something extremely boring that stays exactly the same from one moment to the next. Then in general, you will see all kinds of very interesting random variation, whether that's measurement error, whether that's biological variation, whether that's enigmatic variation, as it has been called, all these different kind of random processes that we can never really get a grasp on, but they are always happening. And then finally, we could imagine that there is this other summary of all the non-random things that have made this variable different from what it was. And that thing, that element of the follow-up, we call exogenous change. But when you think about it, it is the part of the follow-up that was not previously, that has not been determined by the previous variable. Okay? The element of Y1 not determined by Y0. So this is what we argue, that the causal effect of y0 on y1 is not change. This um, is the part of y that doesn't change. That's the part that's being determined, that is set in train by y0, and is, in a sense, passed on through time. Okay? So, consider a fixed variable, y0 and y1. Nothing has changed. Okay, they are literally exactly the same variable measured at two points in time. There's no change. What would this look like on our graph? 
and Lord's, kind of a version of Lord's graph. Well, they're perfectly correlated. So exactly as kind of Lord described, you would see this 45 degree um, identity line and you would see that Y1 was indeed exactly the same as Y0. Great. Let's make the world a little bit more complex and realistic now. And imagine two variables that are broadly the same, but they randomly fluctuate from one moment to another. So this could be my height from one day to another. I mean, I don't know whether there's non-random factors, but essentially there are very small reasons that are effectively random why one day I'm more hunched than another day, or I slept badly or whatever. Okay, so there's this random variation, but we still essentially have what we might call no overall change. But what does that look like when we try and plot it on one of those graphs? Well, Lord imagined that it would look like this. You have the identity line in the middle, which because they're effectively the same variable. But then you have some data clouding around that representing variation. Well, Lord was missing something. And indeed, this is where a lot of people have got lost. Because where two variables are imperfectly correlated, you will always see dilution of the relationship between them due to regression to the mean. Now, this isn't some artifact of measurement error. This isn't some nuance of repeated data. This is a universal law that happens in all data where they are imperfectly correlated. So what you see, instead of that perfect ellipse sitting on the identity line, is it will always be tilted away. The identity line is a red herring. The identity line is drawing us towards something that has no meaning when variables are not essentially the same variable. Okay? The only line, I would argue, the only curve, whatever, it doesn't matter what the functional relationship looks like. But the only thing that really matters from uh, the, the, let's say, the, the line perspective that, that represents the serial relationship is um, the, the true relationship, not some idealized version between Y0 and Y1. Deviations from that line or curve or whatever in this example then represent the random variation. They are, the fact that they exist, they have introduced this dilution. We cannot have the identity line relationship and have any kind of variation um, between two variables, okay? So, we can now extend that thinking to look at a situation where there's now a causal change process taking place. Okay, so there's not just random fluctuation, but there's also exogenous change that mean that Y0 and Y1 are not perfectly correlated. Again, you would have this serial relationship between them, but it will be diluted because they're not the same variable. Okay, so you would have the tilted axes. And the deviations from that axis represent the, the, the random variation and the change, okay? So, if you're with me on that and you're happy with that, you may not be, because this is the crux. This is obviously what everyone has debated and argued over. It leads very simply to saying, if we then want to know the effect of some exposure on change and some outcome, then we want to know the effect of the exposure on the non-random part of follow-up that was not determined by Y0. So on that exogenous change element. So that is approximately equal to the effect of X on Y1 conditional on Y0. A part of Y1 not already explained by Y0. But what you should be able to see here, of course, is that will always be a conflation of the true random components and 
the structural change. We cannot separate those two things. But nevertheless, this will give us an approximation. And depending on the size of the random component, then um, versus the causal component, um, then we will obviously have either a larger um, uh, effect or a more diluted effect. Because if we're trying to, if this was a purely random process, we wouldn't expect to see any relationship between our exposure and change. Whereas if there was no randomness to it and we had everything nailed down and we could precisely work out exactly what the structural change was, then of course we would expect X, the relationship between X and this element to be as close to change as possible. But the, the message then that follows is that this is not the effects of X on the change score. The change score is an acolyte of the identity line. It believes that the identity line is the thing that we are interested in. And as a consequence, it gives us these deviations from that line that I would argue have absolutely no causal meaning whatsoever. Um, and the, the consequence is that they're not only adding information to some variables, but they're taking them away from others. Which is a very interesting kind of Perhaps it averages out, you know, perhaps this is just noise and we don't need to worry about it too much. Well, no, absolutely not. And this is what I really want to highlight now. So we've agreed, I hope, that the change score analysis and the other approach give you different estimates. I would argue that the estimate from the analysis of change is obscure. It has no real causal meaning. And I would invite anyone who is listening to this and disagrees to actually tell me, what does it mean? Because I've never heard anyone define it in a way that means anything sensible. Because when you actually derive what's going on, it is equivalent to the total causal effect of your exposure, let's say sex, on your outcome, follow-up weight, minus the total causal effect of your exposure on baseline weight. I'm not familiar with any philosophical, statistical, epidemiological, um, or other justification for calculating this estimate, or indeed have never come across any formal explanation for what this estimate means. Um, it looks like this. What I would say is that when I look at that, I see that it involves two variables. It involves the effect of X, or sex, on Y1 and Y0. And that there's a big fat minus sign in the middle. So somehow I am estimating some kind of joint effect. And whatever school you come from, that should ring a few alarm bells. Why do I want a joint effect? Really, usually you're trying to home in on a more um, well-defined effect. Now, statistician two, better or worse, at least, is aiming in that direction. I would say the estimand that Statistician 2 is approximating is the direct effect of sex on follow-up weight. So that is simply um, what does X do to Y1, conditional on Y0, um, comparing different values. Why is it the direct effect? Well, in this specific example, is because I believe that whatever that, that, that sex as a variable, broadly speaking, will have acted and occurred considerably before baseline weight and follow-up weight. Although there will be localized features of it, on the whole, it will be causing both. So we would estimate the direct causal effect. So this, in some senses, does not disagree with what has been argued before. Pearl said that both statisticians were correct but each estimated a different effect. But the second statement here is what I disagree with, in a sense. Statistician one aimed at estimating the total effect of gender on weight gain. And based on the data available, properly concluded there was no difference. I would argue the total effect of anything on gain means nothing. Because as we said before, change scores don't capture exogenous change. They are a 
misleading conflation of information from both determining parents. Now, if you don't believe me, I'm going to show you how dangerous they can be. This is where we step into the problems of determinism. Y1 minus Y0 is not a natural variable. It is what the clerk has calculated. It is this conflation of Y1 minus Y0. We have placed a huge negative sign behind part of its origin. And that negative sign introduces many of the problems that it then goes on to create. And the simplest example of that problem is understood when we consider what are known as tautological associations. So this is my kind of simple example of why chain scores do not help you. When we analyze a chain score in direct relation to one of its parents, well, what do you expect to happen? These are tautological. The chain score is defined by Y1 and Y0, and therefore we will see a large tautological association. This kind of thing happens when we ask questions like, how does baseline determine change? So here we have this scenario, baseline weight leading to follow-up weight. If we were to ask what is the relationship between baseline weight and change, there will be a huge tautological association. And for those who like to write out their equation, it's obvious. It's on both sides. Y0 is there as your exposure, and minus Y0 is there in your outcome. So we have a very different terms you can call it, but we clearly have a complete violation of independence. Um, and this, for those who are interested, explains the law of initial value. Okay? The fact that people, for example, who have higher initial values end up with larger decline is because a higher initial value means a higher negative initial value. And so you'll see that tautological association. Of course, for many, this is not obvious. And when I say for many, I mean, well, me, 10 years ago, this was definitely not obvious. Um, I think this is my second paper where I analyzed the relationship between long function at age, fifth, uh, age 14 and change in long function thereafter. And I end up concluding that there is some fascinating, bizarre, negative association between your long function at 14 and change thereafter and say, well, it could be regression to the mean, but other explanations are plausible. Because I didn't know what I meant there and what I go on to say is other mechanistic explanations. What I now know is, well, it was tautology. But when we're not looking at the change score in relation to itself, in a sense, such as here, we're looking at some external exposure in relation to Y0 and Y1, it is no longer so obvious that there's going to be a problem. Certainly, if we were to write out the equation, as we, as we might be trained to do, there is no longer the obvious tautology of Y0 operating on both sides. However, when you think about it, any correlation between your exposure X and your outcome at baseline Y, 0, in a sense means they share part of the same um, origin. It doesn't matter what that correlation comes from. X, as soon as X is correlated, it is partly Y0. And as soon as that happens, we'll introduce a strange negative association with the chain score. Because we're talking about tautology here. Remember, Y0 causes change extremely strongly. It is literally 50% of the variation in the change score. Then you will introduce, you can very quickly introduce a negative element that will overwhelm anything that's causally interesting. And it's that disagreement between change score analysis and the analysis of follow-up, it's that negative sign that really is causing you all these problems. So the, the, the size of the disagreement between the two analyses that you do will depend on the size of the correlation between your exposure um, and your outcome. So 
when the association between x0, or between x and y0 is small, like a randomized controlled trial, well then, in a sense, minus y0 in the change score doesn't matter that much. And the, the, the answer that you get from the two analyses will converge, okay? That's why you don't see these problems happening in randomized data. In a sense, when we, we write out the S demand, it's because the Y0 bits disappear. They're irrelevant. They're just noise. But as that association increases, then so the relationship between X and Y0 will dominate. And because we've changed it, because we've neg put this negative sign in front of it, then we will increasingly be dragged into the negative world. Okay. So I keep going. I'm just checking that uh, I'm not being told. I'm running out of time. <laughs> um, I would say, Peter, if you could if you could wrap up in the next five minutes, would that be yeah. okay? Great. Indeed. So um, I will try and wrap up in the next five minutes, which means there will be an addendum for those who are interested on difference in differences. Um, but essentially, I want to give the example here. Um, this is uh, uh, where there isn't a, a tautological relationship between them, where um, participants with higher wine consumption during adolescence subsequently gained less weight. Those kind of relationships, those kind of findings exist right across the applied literature where people have used change scores, where you see these very confusing inverse associations. And I would put huge amounts of money, sadly I don't have any money to put on these kind of bets, but I would make quite large bets um, that in all these situations, it's because of the artifacts of analyzing um, the change score. So um, we're certainly uh, at the point uh, where you may be exhausted by um, the complexities of this problem. And this is where, um, had there been time, I would have gone on to tell you about the difference um, in differences, uh, which, broadly speaking, I'll give you the, 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 the headline message here. It does not account for regression to the mean. Okay? So the idea that two extreme groups would naturally remain the same over time forgets that when you have two different extreme groups, then you would expect them to be less extreme next time. So the parallel lines assumption within difference and difference analyses is wrong. And from that, you realize essentially that it is not giving you anything useful. So I'm gonna conclude. We've uncovered something, whether we've resolved the paradox, I don't know, but I would say, so statistician two has given you the direct causal effect, but it will always be diluted by random variation. Okay, so you're always getting an underestimate of what's really going on. In contrast, statistician one is giving you something that they're very confident about, but is obscure. And in the worst case, can be extremely misleading. So, I'm going to move on and say the blue team, in my view, wins. <laughs> They're the ones who said chain score analysis can't be trusted. Um, and summarize. Lord's paradox is a mind-boggling puzzle uh, that has confused uh, a lot of people, but certainly collectively has confused us as scientists for 50 years. It centers on the fact that chain score analysis can return radically different results to estimators based on analyzing the follow-up. In order to understand it, we have to tumble down the rabbit hole and grapple with what it is we mean by change and confront the universal reality of regression to the mean. And the implications are that analysis of change scores, is this, if you believe what I'm saying, should be avoided and indeed that they're actually really quite dangerous and prone to giving you inverse kind of numbers, at least they're pointing, whatever they mean, that they often point in the opposite direction to the more well-defined causal effects we might be interested in. But finally, the thing I want to say is that Lord's paradox 
it's just about analyzing three variables, right? And yet we have struggled collectively as a community for 50 years to understand what is going on. So if nothing else, I hope that it exposes what I believe to be a very humbling demonstration of the difficulties of analyzing non-experimental data and hopefully indicates that this is not something we should do lightly and imagine is easy. Thank you very much. Peter, thank you so much. And I'm sure if we had the 108 participants uh, in the room clapping, you would, you would just, you can imagine the applause. So I'm um, sorry that we can't do this in person once again. Uh, I would just like to um, say a big thank you to everyone who is now um, watching this later on on YouTube. We're actually gonna stop the recording and go over to the Q&A session.